a full deal, Lord. If your love, we thank you for the church and the many blessings, dear Lord, that we have ourselves daily. We pray for those, dear Lord, that are unfortunate, that don't have the things that we do. We lift our hearts out to them. We lift our hearts out to the people, dear Lord, that is having these floods and our homes are destroyed. We just pray that you listen to them, dear Lord, that in everything that we pray, we pray your will be done. Amen. 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 One more, number 217. <laughs>
Have any Johnny Cash fans here tonight? Yeah. Sure. I do a Boss Carwell song. Johnny Cash style, man. <coughs> Good time today at uh, Sloan Street General Baptist. Them ladies there know how to cook too. <laughs> what is good is here though. Oh, yeah. This will get it done. It's been done. It's been all right. We had a good time this morning. I miss being at Union Grove, folks. <laughs> Thank you. 
be a thinking of another while you're singing the one you're singing. I don't know, I was singing this morning and this song just kept coming to mind while I was singing another one. I guess I was supposed to sing that this morning, but it wasn't on the CD. But I'll do it tonight. He made a change. Processes. 
37% believe humans always existed in their present form. 27% say humans <laughs> evolved due to God's design. 4% say they don't know. 3% say humans evolved, but they don't know how. Uh, something else that I learned this week. If you uh, touch your thumb to your finger, uh, there's this uh, uh, tendon that comes up. You, you know why that's there? That's, that's a leftover remnant from where we evolved from hanging off branches. <laughs> do, you know that, do you know that the reason you don't have a tail anymore is because we got smart enough to walk on the ground and fend for ourselves. We didn't have to have that extra uh, appendage to help hold on the tree. Interesting, isn't it? I didn't either. I, the things that you learn as you, when you... Uh, or out in the world, what, what people share with you. I, I, you know, I just want to enlighten you guys this, this evening. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me, I say that to say this. I don't believe that. I never have. But I want you to know that people listen to what they're told. And they're going to form an opinion based on what they hear. We go into a study tonight on the Laodicean church. What are they known for? You guys have heard about them before. You've, you've read the scriptures. Uh, what, uh, what is uh, one statement that comes to mind? Uh, if, if I would dare to uh, hand that over to everyone tonight. Revelation chapter 3. One of the things that it is known for is the lukewarm church. Not hot, not cold. If you look into the scriptures as well, we see it has some, uh, um, some things that are familiar to some of the other churches that have been looked at, that we've looked at. And this is also the church with a closed door. When you look at the scripture, you'll, you'll find that here in just a minute as we, as we go into it. Revelations chapter 3, I think it's around verse 14. Yeah, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind <coughs> and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as also I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your correction. We thank you for the truth and, and what we have to read. Father, we, we're thankful that you give us a mind to think a heart to, to go and, and to reach the, the people of this world. Father, I pray that you would revive your churches. Just as the scripture says, wilt thou revive us again? Would you give us the life to, to realize who we are, not to forget what we've been called to do? Help us to see our mission. Father, I pray a very personal time tonight that each and every one would look at their life 
and ask themselves what their plan is. What do I plan to do for you in the next month, in the next, in the next week, in the next year? Lord, that we might be involved in this great mission of the spread of the gospel in this world. Father, I thank you for your word, again, that is able to make one wise. I pray you give me direction and instruction and lead me in, in the words to speak tonight. Father, that you are glorified and honored and that your church grows as a result of hearing your word. Father, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we have a lot of information as we do it, but we begin with who is who is called the church and who is who it is that is, is sharing the message. Again, this is Christ Jesus. When we look at the uh, at the uh, the description of who he is, we begin to see authority. We begin to see this, this power of God re revealed to us. Who it is that is saying this. And, and when we do this, we should pay attention. It's not just somebody off the street. This is, this is Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Messiah. He is the one that is, is speaking to the church of Laodicea, but also speaking to each and every one of us tonight. As we read the Word, we, we look at it and we can't help but apply the information that is given, the rebuke, the concern for the church here to each and every one of us today. Uh, as we look at the Word, do we not see the, the problems that we do ourselves and we, do we not see what needs to be changed in our own lives? I, it's it's re very revealing at times and... and uh, Sometimes it, uh, it, it's hard to take. But here we have the authority. He is the true. Or we know that He is the faithful, even to the suffering and giving of His own life on the cross. He is faithful. He is true. He did not deviate from the course that was set before Him. He endured the suffering. He sacrificed His very life on the cross. That which had to be done in order to save mankind. This is exactly what he did to save men from their sins. He gave us life. Even praying, not my will be done, but thy will be done. The only uncreated one who was there from the beginning, through whom nothing was created except by him. Are you with me tonight? Sometimes people out there in the world have this idea and they have this question, where did God come from? Who created Jesus as if He was just born of Mary and that was the beginning? He has always been there from the beginning. Amen. Without Him, nothing was created that was created Amen. according to the Scriptures. I would say, thus saith the Lord God. Yes. That reveals something to us. Jesus was not invented. He was not of man. He, he was not created or made up. But from the beginning, He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega. As we look, and I would go on to say he is, praise God, the present as well. If we're looking at all time, he is still Jesus today. Amen? He still makes a difference. He still changes hearts. He changes lives. And when we fail to, to share that out, people are going to start falling for what they hear. They're going to hear a lot of strange things. Some people are, are, are misled through just what they think. Each of us at one time or another was misled in what we thought. But thanks to the Lord and somebody else going out, we've been shown the truth. It was revealed to us. The problem with the church, described as the lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. And Jesus says to them, because you are, are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. You guys love that taste of, of nice warm water, don't you? you? You take a drink of something, you know, that maybe just warmed up just a little bit, or maybe it's hot and cooled off. Uh, there's nothing better than a nice, refreshing bottle of hot water in the summer. Please agree with me on that. I, I, I would have to disagree with myself there. What, what kind of debate are we getting into? So I'm, I'm saying something I'm disagreeing with myself. No, I'm just kidding. The, we don't like that. There is something that displeases us about the taste of that water so much that we do not want to consume it. 
We know, I, I believe, I'm sure you guys do the same, that coffee is best served hot. Well, not anymore. It's served cold. My land's going to debate that. But me, I, I, I desire my coffee hot and water cold. <laughs> I know there's iced coffee, but it still it's cold. But to how many of you like your coffee after it's cooled off just enough to where uh, uh, it's not hot anymore and it's not cold? It's kind of like, ugh. I'll take a drink. I, I, I may get into a study or something and set it on the table before me and I forget. And I reach up and I, 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 and what I do is I spit it back in the cup. It's the same coffee as it was before, right? But it has a different taste, a different texture. It's something that, again, is not pleasing to us. <clears throat> Here, the church that is lukewarm, it is neither on fire or active or steadfast about God's work for the kingdom. This is representative of what it means uh, as we say something is on fire, uh, active or steadfast as something that is is. Uh, doing something, hardworking, serving God till He comes. But here's a church that is not on fire. It's not hot. And it's not cold. Cold would be, I think, to the other extent of, of reprobate, doing nothing, uninvolvement whatsoever. But then you have something that's, that's somewhere in the middle here. And the problem with that being... <laughs> being uh, the reason has a problem is it's very misleading to people. I say that I'm one thing, but yet my actions don't show a, a heart that is poured out to do that which God has called us to do. We become lax, indifferent. We forget, but we also get comfortable. Well, I don't want to do this. You know, somebody else can take care of that. You know, I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, uh, I just like church as it is. Now, that's, that's my reasonable sacrifice. I get up on Sunday morning early and I come to church. God knows I suffer. I, I think that even today, and, and there, there is concern. As, as we look at these the various churches in Revelation, one Someone has said that this is the progression of the church to a present-day church in Laodicea. I would say if there was something that defined the modern church today, it would be this example. That bothers me. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. So we realize that. This is going to get to you tonight. What are we doing about it? What are we doing to change things? It's up to us. I mean, God has set us in place to, with this mission, and if we don't, what's going to happen? Nothing. The church will close. We'll go on. Uh, remember that one place we used to all attend? We just had the greatest of times uh, out in the country there. Uh, something Grove. I, it, it's it's hard to to talk about that and and to think in the future if if we were to to look at ourselves today and what we are doing for the kingdom of God and we were to project that same uh, action ten years twenty years thirty years down the line where would we be? That's what scares me the most about the church today. I'm not talking about just here, but the church, the body of Christ. It scares me. It, it bothers me. I know I'm not supposed to be in fear of, of anything, but if there's one thing that, that concerned me today, it would be the condition of the church and its heart to reach lost people. Since Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, that was His mission, and He fulfilled it completely, <coughs> That should be our mission as well. To seek out those that are lost, those that need Him, and to share Him with them so that they would have that. <laughs> they would obtain salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Not that I can save them. Not that I can, 
keep them from getting out of hell. Not that I could do that myself, but I take them to the one who can. I direct them to him. This is what the scripture tells us. This is what you need to do. Take this time to do that before it's too late. Verse 15, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because this is this he brings them right to their to the forefront of their minds, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. They've forgotten who they are. They've forgotten this, this mission and they have become self-sufficient. They've done well for themselves. This is a uh, church of Laodicea is located in that city of Laodicea, which was a very rich, wealthy port. A crossroads as well, a lot of trade there, a banking center, so to speak. This was a, a, a very wealthy place. They didn't have need for anything. They had all the money they needed. They, they had all the food they wanted, all the clothing. and, and they, So they... Um, it sounds very familiar to some of the doctrines that are being preached today in what is called the church. The, that prosperity doctrine that, that has entangled so many people. God has just blessed me, and He has. But they have forgotten that that blessing came from their relationship with the King of Heaven. It, it, and there are other people out in this world that need to have that same thing. There's a, a concern as, as far as their actual condition and the reality that the, the problem with prosperity is I forget. Things are good. I don't realize that things are bad. Jeremiah had the same problem. The prophets and, and that were in his time were telling the people that everything's okay, don't worry about it, nothing's wrong. And 70 years later, they're still in captivity. I, I tell you, things are not good. You know that. Uh, that's, that's no news. But nothing's going to change unless the church does something about it. That's what we're called to do. Make a difference. Amen. Do something. So in my prayer, again, this is something that God put on my heart tonight. I want you to think about this. Look at the last five years in your personal life. Have you been on fire? Have you been cold? Have you been lukewarm? That's about as personal as it gets, doesn't it? I'm going to run out of here before the guys get mad. He's got a club after me. He's going to get me here. Just a minute. So now we've examined ourselves. We we decided we were we were one of the three. So now I ask you this: You realize your condition, where you're at. What are you going to do next week? What are you going to do next month? What are you going to do next year? Have you sat down with God and said, "What would you have me do? Reveal to me." How you would have me make a difference? Take time. I mean, this, and I think it's serious enough that we should. What is my plan to be a witness in the next year to come? How am I going to make a difference in the world? When you go to God, He may reveal to you something that uh, may surprise you. Be prepared to let Him make a difference in your life. To change the way you look at what you've been doing. To take a look at who you are. I don't want you to be uh, cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be active in the church. In the kingdom work that God sets before you. Doing that which 
He empowers you to do, not what you think you're able to do. Because they're two different things. God would say for us to do one thing, and I'm going to say, I can't do that. But I believe that you can. Because everything that God puts for us to do, He empowers us and enables us to do that very thing. Always has. One of the things, the words that, that describes the, the cold, as I think about this, and we've got these cute little baby bunnies at home. Some of them get adventurous, and they think they can go outside the nest without mom. Well, every once in a while, one of them will, will fall out onto the wire when you have cold weather like we've had the last couple of days. They don't do so well. Every once in a while, one will get real adventurous and he'll climb out through the wire and fall onto the ground and then he'll get cold and wet. You can pick those little guys up and they're just as stiff as a, a popsicle. Uh, I'll, I'll tell Lynn, I'll take one if, it, if it's still alive, if we caught it soon enough. We'll take it in the house and we begin to uh, uh, hold on to it. Now what I do is I just open my pocket up and I drop them in there and I go about my day. I know that it, and here, this is how they get, they just kind of like, Barely moving. And they, it's like they're partially froze. It's not cold enough to freeze, but they, they, there's a word that, that, that describes them. Uh, um, it's like they're just barely alive and, and not moving very much. Maybe you guys have heard that. Lethargic. I knew that already. Just trying to get you guys to fall. Lethargic. They, they get to where they don't move. They, they just they, they get to where um, their muscles are, are stopped and they, they can't go about doing anything. But then once they're warmed up, it's back to life as normal. They're popping and jumping and, and carrying on. And I take them out there, drop them back in the nest box. And uh, one, I've put him in the nest box three times now. I, I don't know why he does that. I, I caught him. Uh, I caught him in this condition the other day, cold, wet, and dirty. Not much different from some church people. <laughs> I didn't say anybody. I just said some. <laughs> Where are we as the church today? I, I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be serving God to the best of my ability. I want to have that zealousness that, that is of, of the disciples. I want to be wanting to go out and make a difference in the world, not concerned about who I'm going to step on, whose feet I'm going to step on, who I'm going to make mad because I'm serving God. That's, that's a difference now. I, if I'm just going out to make people mad, I'm just being hungry. But if I'm doing it to serve God and there's people in the way, I need to just push them over and keep going. Amen. Right? Do I have that same desire if it led to it to even become a martyr for the cause of Christ? I think that's lost in the church today. Mm -hmm. We've become lethargic. But also we've come to the point where mm -hmm. everything's fine. Everything's good. We've got church to sit in. We've got padded pews. We've got a heat and air conditioning system. Man, we've got it made. What did he tell them? Where did they come from? What is it? Uh, uh, let's see here. Let me get back on track here. Here's how he describes them. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's their true condition. <clears throat> One of the authors, as I studied uh, some time back, describes lukewarmness as the greatest spiritual epidemic facing the church today. That was some years ago. Their position, their condition, is not what they think. They, they feel that things are going well, that things are okay, but yet they forget who it is. We're rich and increased with goods, having no need of anything. What does it mean to be wretched? A person is unhappy, sad, despairing, mournful, 
of poor quality or distressed state. Miserable is basically the same thing in just a little different wording. Blindness is being unable to see as a, usually without your eyes not working or you're, they're blinded where you don't have a good vision to, to see out. But it also means without guidance. As we looked at this morning, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit, not of the flesh. They are without spiritual guidance. There's also something else that we talked about last week that really puts new light on the scripture. He says they're naked. If from here you're, you're naked. Naked. Not that they were walking around without clothes, but there was something missing. Right? With Adam and Eve that was taken off of them that made them naked. The image of God. His righteousness. It was not there. So if they're naked and they're blind, I would say that God is not with them. We see a little bit farther down in verse 20. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He tells them, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. But never does it say that anybody opened the door and let him in. What's a church without Christ? It's a dead church, but it's also a lukewarm church. So it's one that says they're of Christ, but he is not there. Nothing inside. Hollow. He says they can purchase some things, not that they're actually could go and buy righteousness or the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but it means that they are sorely lacking these things. These things are not of them and, and a part of who they are. Again, I think this church, this message is not just for them as the Laodicean church at the time, but it is, is for us today. I, I don't want our church to become like them. So we have to guard against that. We have to do according to the scriptures. And, and those that he loves, he, he rebukes and he, he chastens. And we should be thankful for that. Because that's exactly what he's doing to them. We know the church of Laodicea goes on. It doesn't close. It, it goes on. It carries out. The recommendation that has been given to this church, and I believe to our church today and to all the church, is to be zealous and repent. Some people at this time were persecuted because of their zealousness. <clears throat> they were martyred. They were crucified. I, I think sometimes we're afraid of that too. I, I, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want people to, to think I'm some kind of nut. we got plenty of those, right? But that leads me to this. You guys will appreciate this. Maybe. When I get into heaven, when I start eternity, how am I going to be known? As the, the zealot from Raleigh, El Dorado, or the one who did nothing to expand the kingdom of God? Or somewhere in between. I, zealousness in heaven is a good thing, guys. It's a good thing to be known for. That you are active in promoting the kingdom of God and the spreading of the gospel. And it means that you were, were working and serving instead of lukewarm, lethargic. Oh, I, I think of lethargic as when I've had too much to eat and I just can't go any farther. I, I get tired, I get sleepy. I think of only myself at that point. I just need to take a nap. But the church can't afford to take a nap. I don't believe that, that we were called to, to, uh, to serve for just a short time and, and say, well, and pass it on to someone else. I, I think as long as we're here, we're meant to serve God. We're meant to honor Him and do it in such a way that we are zealous. 
Now, the good thing about it is I, I'm not trying to convince you tonight. I'm just going to share with you what the scriptures say. So I looked up some things that in regard to zeal or zealousness. <coughs> These are recommendations like uh, others be zealous and, and repent, like the, the church there. Um, but what would you be, what would you rather be known for? Being zealous or lukewarm? That was the other word. 1 Corinthians 15.58, my beloved.